morning, everyone. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Hopefully you had a nice evening. Enjoyed yourself last night? I did. So uh, welcome again to our second annual CIO Summit. Uh, we're delighted to once again host this event together, obviously, with our partner SAP and with our kind sponsors. Thank you so much for supporting the event. Last year, for, for, for those who've attended the event, uh, we had about 60 give or take CIOs and executives from uh, various uh, walks of industry. And it was really a nice way to kind of launch the platform. This year, in terms of uh, quality of attendees, quality of uh, uh, agenda, we plan to take it to a very much higher level. Um, and I think you'll enjoy today very much. Uh, so happy to see so many of you that I have worked with over the uh, course of the last couple of years. But those of you who don't know me, my name is Rami Branitsky, and I'm a partner at Sapphire Ventures. So again, on behalf of Sapphire, on behalf of SAP and our kind sponsor, con sponsors, thank you so much and welcome. So why are we here today? And uh, you know, the theme of, uh, of, of the discussion today is going to be about the personalization of customer experience. So I figured, you know, might as well tell you a little story that uh, maybe kind of illustrates some of the uh, some of the concepts that we we're talking about. And in the process, I'm going to lament about uh, about my situation. So um, I drive a Tesla. Anyone else here owns a Tesla? Love the car, huh? Yep, great car. I've had it for about three years, and it's been doing great. But over the course of the last couple of months, it started to develop this annoying whiny sound in the motor, in the electric motor. And uh, I figured at some point, I'm going to do something about it. I was just kind of like dragging my feet, didn't, wasn't really sure about what to do, when to go to the service, and so on. About a couple of weeks ago, I think Consumer Report came out with downgrading of Tesla as far as the, uh, the customer experience and as far as reliability. So I went online, and Tesla has this form that they moderate. I went online, and of course, you know, Tesla has like hardcore followers, just like Apple used to in the, back in the day when it was still delightful product. Um, and um, and uh, of course, there was a lot of bashing of consumer reports, these idiots, and so on. And I said, guys, you know, I have a problem the second time around with the same motor, so not sure what's going on. That was on a Thursday. <clears throat> on a Saturday, I get a phone call from the Tesla factory in Fremont saying, sir, we saw that you have a problem with the motor. You've complained about it online. Why don't you come in on Tuesday, and we'll actually replace it for you for free. I said, well, Tuesday, I have 30, 30 CIOs plus the president of SAP who are here. Not going to work, but why don't I come on Friday? And so Friday, I have an appointment to switch the unit. The whole point is not only to, uh, to complain about the car um, and share it with you, uh, but it's really about how a company does very well in terms of using technology to identify and tackle a problem that you have as a customer, which I think is something that uh, is not always thought about. When we think about extreme personalization, we always think about how do I acquire another customer? Or you know, how do I identify my next lead, so to speak? But there's much to be said about the ability to use technology in terms of servicing and making your customer happy. And that's going to be one of the many points that we're going to be discussing today. So going back to the agenda, uh, at uh, Sapphire and, of course, at SAP, we talk to CXOs pretty much on a, on a regular basis. And what we hear repeatedly from many of you, regardless of any industry that you're in, is that the technology ecosystem that you're dealing with is changing rapidly. And it's not as simple na to navigate and to understand as it once was. Even as you consolidate relationship with any one particular vendor uh, or particular technology, there's still a lot of innovation that you want to consume and you must consume in terms of staying in front of your competition. Now, how do you do it in a scalable way? How do you do it in a cost-effective way? Is obviously one of the things that, uh, that are always top, top of mind for everyone. And there's pressure from the business to do it faster and to do it seamlessly. Now, the rapid pace of innovation in areas such as AI, machine learning, cloud infrastructure, and so on and so forth, it's not only promising, but it could also be daunting because it's exponential in how fast technology evolves. The work environment. The work environment is rapidly changing. With the advent of mobile, all of us find ourselves working from anywhere at any time. 
And it's your job as a CIO and of course your CISOs to make sure that you have an uninterrupted, safe and reliable service for any of your users. Line of business users, and I'm sure that that's gonna be a key conversation today. Well, they demand much more from the applications than they used to. They want an always on availability with consumer grade usability. <clears throat> your customers, going back to my earlier example as a Tesla customer, customers demand simple yet powerful ways to interface with your business or else. All of these trends, coupled with the billions of dollars that are going into startup innovation every year, make the role of the CIO ever more complex. And that's why we always feel when we talk to CIOs that your job is not necessarily radical, radically different than the one of a venture capitalist. You have to optimize and you have to rationalize a seemingly endless web of possibilities and you have to do it taking into consideration your existing infrastructure and obviously how you can infuse new ways in which you can innovate and uh, bring to life some additional gems of technology that are available to you. So today we wanted to facilitate the conversation on what, ma what matters to you. And we want to do it in a way that uh, does not necessarily advocate or promote any one particular vendor or particular technology. We really want to focus a about you know, what matters to the CIOs. And so we declared this room today a no pitch zone. The CIO Summit is also about exposing you to the most relevant technologies that you should be aware of. It is about providing you with the right framework and tools to help you navigate the startup ecosystem. By the same token, for the startup CEOs and to the investors who are in the room today with us, think of today as a rare window into the CIO's mind. And last but not least, today is about reciprocity. So we want to hear from all of you, and uh, we definitely expect to hear from all of you on all various topics that we're going to be discussing. As your co-host today, SAP and Sapphire, we bring very different yet complementary vantage point in terms of the conversation. SAP, I think SAP needs hardly any introduction, is the premier application provider in the world of enterprise IT. Sapphire Ventures, those of you who don't know us, we are a leading international capital firm, venture capital firm. And uh, you may or may not be aware, we spun out of SAP about five years ago. Uh, so we, obviously, we still have very strong connection back to, to SAP and work very closely with SAP on a variety of topics. Today, we have about, give or take, 700 startups in our extended portfolio globally. And uh, we've been recognized as a top five VC in terms of our returns and exits over the course of the last few years, and we're very proud of it. So by coming together, I think that we have the, the ability, the unique ability to convince key players from various walks of industry. And also, if you talk to people uh, last night, as I did, from all kind of like all corners of the world as well, which is fun and interesting. At Sapphire, our tagline is to the power of enterprise. Now, what does that mean? When I look around this room, I see the physical manifestation of that tagline with Global 2000 organization with market cap exceeding $1.5 trillion in the aggregate. And we're looking at IT and R&D budgets in the tens of billions of dollars all in this room combined. I see many successful startups that I'm glad you'll have a chance to meet today. And these successful startups are breaking new grounds in various areas of industry, uh, in healthcare, cloud, infrastructure, AI, and so on. And I see many of my colleagues and peers from the various venture capital firms who are providing the necessary fuel to allow for this uh, ecosystem to thrive and grow and do it in the valley and do it globally. The coming together of all these forces and the synergy that is created is the power of enterprise. So summing it all up, the theme for this year's summit is the radical reinvention of customer experience. And we'll explore this theme from various angles and various conversations that I think will complement and provide you with a bigger picture in terms of what it all means. On a personal note, because I know the agenda pretty well, you're in for a treat. I mean, we have some really interesting speakers and we have some phenomenal 
and entertaining um, uh, topics that are going to be uh, discussed here. So I think you're in for a great, great uh, afternoon and, and the rest of the day. And at this point, I'd like to introduce you to our very own Shruti Tornatori, who's going to be our capable MC for the day. Please join me. And uh, have a great day. Here's the clip. Thank you, Rami. Great to be here with all of you today. Um, I don't have a Tesla story to share, or a Tesla for that matter. Uh, but I do have the pleasure of being your MC for the day and also walking you through uh, the agenda and the theme. So I've had the good fortune to be a part of the incredible team here at Sapphire Ventures over the last couple of years. And I've also had a chance to work with many of you in the audience over time. And I wanted to second Rami not only by thanking you for being here today, but also for being a part of the Sapphire Ventures community, which truly makes us who we are. The theme for this year's summit, as Rami mentioned, is about radical reinventions of customer experience. And I think we can all agree that no matter what our industries or businesses, the manner in which we understand, engage, and reach our customers today bears less and less resemblance to how we did so 10, 5, or even 2 years ago. And we at Sapphire actually believe that the disruption of customer experiences is far from over. And we also believe that the new enterprise tech stack is fundamentally different from the previous one. We'll talk about that today, and that it's full of potential. So with that in mind, we've organized the day along a few key thematic threads that we believe really reflect these fundamental shifts in customer-relevant technology stacks. We'll start out uh, with Rob Enslin of SAP, who will talk about the future of ERP in a disrupted digital landscape. Uh, our morning Eve note, Eve Bihar, will talk about how the confluence of design, user experience, and organization can bring together and create amazing end user experiences uh, across enterprises. AI is, of course, arguably the hottest topic of 2016. And we will bring uh, an eminent venture capitalist, well-versed in the field, and innovators from some of the hottest AI startups in the space today to come in and weigh on, an, on this topic for you. We'll talk about big data and the power of analytics when it comes to reaching your customers. And Rami said you were all in for a treat in many parts of the agenda today. Anybody here like hip hop? Anybody here like big data? Well, if you like hip hop, you're in luck. If you like hip hop and big data, you won the lottery. Uh, because we will have a few tricks of the trade thrown in from a music industry media mogul today, but more on that later. We'll talk about the state of venture capital investing in 2016. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Jay Das, one of the managing directors at Sapphire on that. And in the final leg of the program, um, as we gear up to conclude, we'll broaden the conversation beyond pure technology. Um, our spontaneous deregulation session, which is going to feature two well-known luminaries from government and healthcare, will talk about what happens when disruptive technology collides with dated regulation. And concluding all of it will be Jason Ponton, who is editor-in-chief uh, and head publisher of the MIT Tech Review, who will invoke the question of what technology can do not only on an enterprise scale, but on a human and a planetary scale. It's a lot for us to chew on. So we've been careful to build in time throughout the day for all of you to connect, refresh, and reflect. I also wanted to take a moment to extend a big note of thanks to our sponsors. Intel, of course, who is not only our summit sponsor, but also our golf sponsor for the event. Um, our other summit sponsors, Lenovo, MIT Tech Review, and Wilson Sonsini. And of course, last but not the least, our reception sponsor, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, before we move on, a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, your internet credentials, if you need to log in, uh, are in your program booklets. Uh, please be so kind as to silence your mobile devices. And restrooms are out those doors and to your left. And if you're going to be on social media today talking about the event, feel free to use our hashtag uh, or our Sapphire Ventures Twitter handles. And with that, I am excited to introduce Rob Enslin, who is president of the Global Customer organization of SAP and a member of the executive board since 2014. Rob is passionate about technology and its potential for digital business transformation. 
Um, in fact, some of you may not know that Rob actually began his career at SAP as a basis developer in the technical ranks of the company. <laughs> and it's no secret that he's equally passionate about the success of SAP's customers. In that spirit, Rob will share his thoughts on what the future of enterprise systems and ERP holds. Thank Rob, you. please Great. join Thank me. you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm passionate about technology. I'm a basis, ex-basis consultant. My claim to fame at SAP is that I started in basis. So you never get rid of your claim to fame. That makes the, the German developers extremely happy that the head of sales actually has some technical knowledge. Uh, and it's pretty unusual. Um, so I actually have clickers. Um, and, and I'm not going to use any of that. I'm just going to speak for, I guess, 15 minutes, Rami. So, this room's fascinating for me. I actually did not, I didn't think about it coming to Cordoba, but we get to spend probably once a year, uh, the board spends an offsite here in Cordoba. For those that don't know the reason, our chairman founder of SAP owns Cordoba. So <laughs> we get free room and board and access to the restaurant all by ourselves, all seven of us. And it is a whipping that we get to go through <laughs> for two days normally. And if you know Hasso, he has incredible amounts of passion and uh, you never know what the outcome or the agenda or what you are, you cannot be prepared for it. So I, Court of All has extreme memories for me. <laughs> um, both good and both bad. I've been, uh, you know, the four letter word has been used against me in many of these rooms, so. The other, the other interesting thing about this room I think it was four years ago. I might be wrong. It could be five. It could be four. Um, but you can figure out when the name, when I give you the names, you can figure out exactly when, when that was. Um, we, I run an executive advisory board at SAP and I have for six years at SAP. Same customers, twice a year. Um, under NDA, we have extreme discussions. I've just come out of one of those sessions in Berlin. So a lot of this radical customer reinvention is applicable to me. Okay, the feedback I got was pretty clear, radical customer reinvention around SAP. But in this room, Vishal Seeker, Lars Dahlgaard, so you kind of can figure out round about when, met with our executive advisory board. I'm not gonna give you the names, actually probably some of you are in the room. And we broke out, and if you take our executive advisory board, it's all about speaking about what we're gonna do moving forward at SAP. Where are we gonna invest money? What kind of development activity we're we doing? Um, sometimes it's pretty advanced, and sometimes it's to do with today's topics. But four years ago, we told the executive advisory board in this room, I did actually, that we were going big to the cloud. SAP would invest, would shift pretty much 75% of all of our investments into the cloud, whether it be acquisitions, whether it be development, et cetera. Um, the agenda for that meeting was pretty much thrown onto the golf course. There was a mass riot amongst these customers. They'd invested for 20 years. They have got tons of investment with SAP. Their ECC or the old environment you know, was rock solid and they did not want us to deviate from where we were going. So we spent six to seven hours talking through Vishal, Lars and myself. Obviously Lars was pretty clear. He, he didn't care about the on-premise world. He only cared about the cloud world. Vishal and myself were pretty much in, in the middle trying to figure out how to help these customers. We were trying to figure out what we do for lunch. Um, because at this stage, it was a war against them and the SAP folks on this side of the room. Fascinating, the same executive advisory board, I said I ran, run it twice a year, the same executive advisory board we had last week in Berlin, 15 of the 16 customers are fully on board and have moved to the cloud. Not even a discussion. We don't talk about it anymore, it's not a big deal. One of them, and I'm not gonna give you the name because none of you will guess, is still stuck in the on-premise world. So it's quite amazing and it's an unbelievable company as well. Um, don't care for the cloud. I don't have a scientific understanding why they don't care for the cloud or what, why it's not important to them. But what's fascinating is the move 
that occurred in those four years. When it happened, I thought it was really fast, you know, going from kind of a standoff to the cloud. I thought it was kind of fast that, that it had taken place, um, that they'd all bought into the cloud and this is where they were going. Even the German customers, by the way. One of them went to success factors after swearing that the personal data would never be shared in any public domain. Didn't matter if the data center was in Germany, if it was under the ground, they would never go to success factors. They are fully implemented with success factors around the world in data centers all over the world, and they've moved. So change happens fast and customer perception changes fast. I thought it was fast then. When I look back on the four years, I think it's pretty slow. And why do I say that? So we started an executive advisory board in, in Asia, first one. We, we, did, we did the first Asian one in Singapore um, four weeks ago. And what was interesting for me in that executive advisory board is that these customers in Asia were actually way ahead of my other advisory board customers. All they wanted to talk about was IoT, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and investing in big data. They had no interest in talking about S4 and HANA and S4 and HANA and S4 and HANA. They, 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 they passed. That for them, that was done. We've done that. We don't have to discuss it. We're moving on to the next. So what SAP, what are you doing in that space? Many of the governments in Asia had invested in these companies to get digitization to the forefront of where these companies were going. So it kind of took us by surprise. Because actually, to be honest, we didn't really, having run this executive advisory board, we didn't really have a feeling for what Asia would be. I mean, I've, met, I've obviously met lots and lots of customers, but did not really know when you bring the Chinese together with the Japanese, Southeast Asians, or Australians, the Indians in one room, what the dynamics of running an executive advisory board. Pleasantly surprised, very advanced, very focused on the future, and moving at speed of light. Customer reinvention radical, that's what we speak in a little bit about, right? So we go to the executive advisory board in Berlin, the same 16 customers that were in this room four years ago, six years ago. And what was interesting in that discussion was, and let me just step back to the first one in 20, the first meeting we had in 2016. The first meeting in 2016 was all about SAP. You need to integrate your cloud products. You need to have roadmaps. We need to know where the future was. You're not focused on bringing cloud to cloud, cloud to on-premise, and sharing that with us and building that out. Fair enough. On us, we need to do that. So we did that. We started working on that. And so the first part of the meeting was around S4 and HANA. And I would say, slam dunk, finish the meeting, done, well done, SAP, you guys are awesome. So four months later, that's kind of where we moved. I tell you that because in four months, I was going into the meeting expecting that we would have to be very specific, very detailed around many of these topics. And we had done the work on that. The focus for these folks was on where are you with IoT? Where are you with machine learning? What are you doing? And how is that going to change our business? And we need to know about it now. So what you see, what you see is, is, I don't want to say fear, but this constant need for reinventing these businesses because of what's happening in the environment. Um, and that also puts significant pressure on SAP to deliver the next level of technology. Hi, George. Right. I'm great, thank you yourself. Um, so we are very focused on driving IoT and machine learning and artificial intelligence into our products at the next level. We will, and I'm, I'm not making a pitch here, we have organizations focused on, on that. We view it in, um, when you look at the industries, and we can see this from our customers, that we view it in kind of weather terminology. We see companies that we call are in, in the middle of a hurricane, right? They're dealing with massive amounts of turmoil that's happening to them. Some of them are even some of the newer companies that are getting disrupted uh, immediately. And these are typically companies that are in retail industries, banking industries, financial service industries, um, and so on. And then you get companies that are what we call stuck 
in a depression, tropical depression, consumer packaged goods industry. So we, we, we position the consumer packaged goods and some of those industries around there where they are. And it's just the speed at which change is happening to them or they are disrupt or they are disrupting themselves. And then lastly, you get your traditional companies that we call are in the storm. Chemical companies are typically an example of those that are in, in the storm. Um, if, you look, uh, if, you, if you look at the types of companies that are radically changing the, the, the environment, um, Under Armour would be an example where they purchase communities and tying those communities into what they view as a single view of the customer uh, has nothing to do with ERP. It's all to do about the collection of data and applying sciences on top of the data so that they can understand an incredible amount of speed what's happening to you, the athlete, and the impact that it's having on your life. So today they have close to 120 million connections into that environment and the information that they are getting out of it is actually pretty amazing. So Under Armour is trying to change the environment, which ultimately will lead back to what we call as an infinity model. As once that information becomes available, it'll start to change supply chains and start to change the transactions and how you perceive the environment. The issue for, for them is the speed at which they do it and the speed at which they out-execute their competition. What's fascinating when you talk to some of these companies, they actually don't know how to do it. And what's also interesting, they ask SAP for some help. SAP can't be the machine learning artificial intelligence expert for everything. Um, so we will provide a platform. We would have to have a partner. We'd have to have an ecosystem to change that customer experience. Uh, I'll bring another example um, to the fore. It's a company in Indonesia. And they are disrupting Uber. Not Lyft and Uber, a company in Indonesia disrupting Uber. So I was presently surprised. I didn't think Uber could be disrupted. Uh, I thought Uber was the, disrupt, the disruptor in the marketplace. You know, I could tell you every Uber story, every, every sales guy can tell you an Uber story or an Airbnb story. Going to Indonesia, you see scooters flying around the country with little green jackets on. And you can go download from the App Store their little app. It's called Go Jek, J-E-K. 400,000 scooters. Brum, brum. Why in Indonesia is scooters important? Have you ever been, has anybody been to Indonesia, Jakarta? <laughs> the traffic is something else. OK, so unless you've got a police escort, you're going to take four hours to get 15 miles. That's about it. So they come around on their scooters, and they provide you massages. They go get your takeout. They get flowers for your girlfriend or your wife. They come into your office. They pick you up anywhere. You get on the back of the scooter, and you get to the airport. It's bizarre to see people on the way to Jakarta. It's an international airport with a suitcase on the back of a scooter. They're moving into other parts of Asia now. Who's got, who's got the biggest investment in them? Jack Ma. Massive disruption. So even new companies can be massively disrupted exceptionally fast. And so when you talk about are you in the hurricane, are you in the depression, or are you in the storm, every company a year is in one of those phases. Probably SAP is stuck between a depression and a hurricane. Um, our biggest issue is, or our biggest opportunity, is to move SAP into a platform environment, into an open app economy environment, where multitudes of companies can add value on top of our base applications. And you know, we speak about core to the edge, edge to the core. What do we mean by that? We mean S4 HANA, the digital core. It's the cornerstone of every company's digital environment. That was two years ago. Today, it's moved on from that rapidly. The edge application success factors, Ariba, Fieldglass, these are just business applications that every company needs to do their business. 
the value that's going to go on top of that is going to come through machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's going to be the ability to take the data and to make massive amounts of change, information, and reaction to it. And I know everybody talks about big data and mobile and all these things, and we feel like it's real. And it's like big data is old. It's actually past the hype cycles already. Just the problem is most companies haven't figured out how to actually make it happen. But it's past. What's happening now in research labs is about knowledge workspace, it's about neural sciences, it's about using things like Alexa in real time, natural language processing is already on the downside of the technology hype cycles. So if you go and you look at any of these technologies that are going to be in the future, many of them are getting to a maturity stage now, which are not even used in many of your companies. And so the companies that are actually advanced that are using some of these are really going to be the disruptors. And so when we look at it, when I look at it, the scary part for me with SAP is how do we enable that so that customers can actually benefit from that? Whether it's in the manufacturing sector, from an efficiency point of view, understanding what machines are doing, or it's on the customer side and understanding behaviors of customers. That cycle, that infinity cycle, is really what will drive radical reinvention of the customer experience. And the same applies to SAP, the same way that I'm articulating it to you. I see a, another company um, that we work with pretty closely that we will bring a product to market um, in January. It's a small little bus company. Yes, traditional bus company. They drive people around the city just the same way that you would do in any major city. Only 300 people in the company in a little town in Japan called Fukui. And what they are doing is they are putting devices on every driver. And the devices on, on, on each driver tells the behavioral patterns of the driver, the heart rates, when they get stressed, if there's lights happening. And then they can actually determine how to schedule the drivers, putting the drivers on the right routes, take them off the more stressful route, for obviously to improve the people's lives in this little town. That, invent, that, that, that solution will be live actually in January, and that we will call you know, transportation safety. But what's fascinating when I look at that and I think to myself, Matt, how many yellow buses in the US could be using that technology? We take our kids and we put them on a yellow bus. They don't even have safety belts or belts. That's my South African term coming out there, sorry. Um, but these are the kinds of innovations and customer disruption that's taking place today. We will learn from improving people's lives as much as we will learn from improving our business processes. They are not separate. They are interchangeable. And these are the things that will make a difference. What's fascinating for me is that innovation can take place, radical innovation like this, can take place. It's not only here in the valley. It's not in Berlin, Germany. It's not in Singapore. It can take place in a little town in Japan. And it can become standardized across the world. So those are the kinds of things that I'm seeing. Um, I will tell you, um, and I've got the hype cycle here. So when we look at how these applications all fit together in the hype cycle, there are things that we will, we will make available pretty soon, um, whether it be in the Internet of Things or with uh, machine learning. And those kind of things uh, will replace the ability, uh, the, the human capability to execute with what we can actually do with computer science. And you will see many of those applications get launched, at least from an SAP point of view, in the next six months. Um, from simple things like invoice matching, just to give you guys an, a, a, a pure business example, the, we now know that a computer can actually do invoice matching 90% more accurate than a human. I don't know why. You guys know shared services. I guess you can understand why, if we get it right with knowledge and, and data, we can actually be that much more, more accurate. Um, we have included diversity inclusion in our products. Why? Because humans seem to ask questions 
that um, don't allow diversity. And so now we can actually determine how to actually help humans go through that process so that they, they don't do those kind of things. Um, we will implement these in, in our products, but we will provide a platform so that other companies can actually implement these. And I think um, you know, SAP is not, it is absolutely not, will be disrupted if SAP doesn't disrupt. Um, and that's pretty clear over the last three to four years. We've seen it. We've seen the speed at which we have to make these changes, and every other company has to make these changes. So I don't talk about this from a glass tower or from inside a glass house. Um, I know what it feels like to, to break glass. Um, and the speed at which this needs to take place I just go back four months ago. I had folks worried about HANA and S4. Four months later, they don't want to talk about it. They want to talk about IoT, artificial intelligence, big data, and how that changes, and where do they sit in the infinity cycle, and what are we doing to help them. And, and, that's, and that's the world that we, that we live in. So uh, I love it. I think it's awesome. <laughs> um, I think the, the, the level of change is, is phenomenal. The last piece I, I would leave you with is um, this drive is truly happening because it's a multi-change, a multi-dimensional change in the generations which are in the workforce today. And we see it today. Our CIO, who's awesome, by the way, and you know, if for those, we've had a CIO every two years. We love Thomas. Thomas is 31 years old. He is responsible for an 80,000 people company. We have 90,000 Apple devices. Figure that one out. Um, but he's awesome, and he comes with a completely new, fresh mind. Give you my simple example, my transformation. Anybody use direct access in a big company? This is a stupid example, but I'm going to tell it in any case because I'm passionate about this topic. For two years, for two goddamn years, I cannot use my laptop on a plane. Just two years. I can use my iPad, and I can use my iPhone. But I can't use my laptop. I have sent email. I'm a board member of SAP. You would think I would be able to change the security regulations of SAP. This is not possible, OK? <laughs> They have what they call a data protection officer at SAP. This is what I was told for two years. Who reports to the German government, by the way, not to SAP. Thomas came in after two years, and he, gave, he took out my security on my laptop so that I don't have to deal with direct access. <laughs> I now connect on a plane really fast. Like just When I switch it on, it connects immediately. I'm ecstatic. I tell you that because he, as a new, had a different agenda. His agenda was how to help me do my job better. I sent an email to everybody at SAP how cool this was, just that I had direct access. And probably, you know, now he would get more from me than, than any other CIO previously in terms of budgets and what he's doing. <laughs> So my radical customer experience is maybe not as radical, but I promise you, I had sworn to throw my laptop over the Atlantic Ocean at least 50 times. And I was, pre and, and I was pretty close to getting it done. You would ask, well, why didn't you just use the iPad? I've got a bizarre habit of using folders. I can't get rid of it. My iPad can't use folders. So, we are changing that. We're going to go to another, and we're going to put it in the cloud. It's not helpful though, in the cloud when you're on a plane. So certain things are still pretty old world. Um, but just the attitude, the change, and how you experience it makes a huge difference. And you know, a, as a business leader at SAP, um, we are going through radical change with our own, our own solutions. Um, and I can tell you what I told my, um, the IT in my business, the, the, the people that are redoing our systems. I want every account executive to be able to place an order in five seconds. That's the goal. Anything less, it's not worth discussing. I don't care if our systems can handle it. 
If it can't, we'll go to the competition. But we will do that. Because if we don't do that and we don't simplify how we operate internally, it'll have an impact on our customers. And it doesn't matter how good our products are. If our customers don't have a great business relationship with SAP and can feel that business relationship, it won't be enough. So it's not one thing today. It's all of those things today that you have to be good at. And you can't rest on what you were good at in the 90s or the 2000s because that'll, it'll, it'll happen before you even know it. It'll change. And um, I have some friends that run companies that are struggling right now. And it's pretty scary to watch them because they just they don't have enough time. And so time kills you. And I tell you what, 24 hours a day, uh, you have to move pretty quick. So thank you very much. Um, and Rami, I believe we're going to take questions. Thank you, Rob. Is that 15 or 20 minutes? We'll pay for you. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, obviously, given your work at SAP and over the course of the last uh, few years, I mean, you've been working closely with many CIOs. How do you see the transformation in the role of the CIO vis-a-vis -vis some of the trends you talked about? And also in, ter in terms of line of business versus CIO, how, how is that balance looking now from your vantage point? Yeah. Um, I feel that um, the, bus the, the, the CIOs have even more pressure to deliver results in exceptionally short periods of time. Whether those results are part of an overall architecture or strategy or whatever, that, that nobody cares, right? Nobody cares what your problem is. Um, if, if you walk into an environment and you have to explain all the constraints to the business people, uh, you probably would have a very short-lived career. Um, so the change uh, is dramatic and the change is fast. And and I think it's not only the CIO. I think it's across the board. It's whether you're the head of HR, whether you're head of the marketing. Whether, um, you have to deliver unbelievable value inside your own company in every single department that you operate. And there's almost no forgiveness anymore um, because the, because companies are, are not, I wouldn't say scared, but companies are pretty aware that their businesses can, can be ma ma uh, massively transformed. I mean, they, you know, when companies like General Electric say they're going digital, it has a massive impact, right? Um, it impacts everybody because everybody has to go digital. When Davos and all the world's leaders in Davos, and when you're there, you realize that um, those topics of those agendas at Davos become the topics in your company. So when your leaders leave Davos, that's the topic that, that, they, that they're driving. I mean, remember sustainability? That became. Remember digital? That's become, right? So the speed at which you can operate uh, is absolutely, absolutely critical. Unfortunately, technology is one of the biggest drivers of all that change. And um, that lies in the hands of the CIO. And, the really great CIOs that are able to articulate to the CEO and to the board, uh, whether they're on the board or not, on how to get there and uh, to deliver that experience for them are the ones that will actually take those companies to the next level. Absolutely. And last night, by the way, we had uh, dinner and I had a chance to talk to uh, Fumbi Chima, who's the uh, yep. CIO of uh, Burberry, as you know, and she articulated something very similar, which was you got to talk in the language of business if you're a CIO versus the technology language. Obviously, your job being on the fault line is to translate into technology, but that happens later. Yes. First and foremost, be able to articulate the business value of what yeah. you do. I mean, the first response back when we were, we, we were busy going through changing the auto management system, typical old environment, right? I mean, as I said, I want salespeople, uh, inside sales and the web to be able to process orders in five seconds. Right. And the first response back from SAP internal and my folks was all the reasons why they couldn't do it. Um, why we had to wait till 2018 for the demand gen and marketing engine to be able to provide. I, said, I can't wait till 2018. Like that's a whole year. If you can't deliver it, just tell me you can't deliver it and I will go somewhere else. There's a company, maybe one in this room, maybe one in the valley that can at least give me 12 to 18 months of what I need but I'm not waiting that long anymore. 
And this is a change that when you look and you, you look at some of the folks that have been around, that they've never had that come back at them. Typically, it's been okay. Well, maybe we'll we'll implement it in this part of the world. We'll do this little thing. We'll test it there. Those days are kind of gone. So, um, so, so Rob, I want to, given that we are here in Cordoval, that obviously invokes some extreme emotions. Yeah. Um, He's in, not here though. But we're very close to, to Silicon Valley still, and we have a bunch of uh, bunch of folks who are investors and startup, you know, uh, executives and founders. And from your perspective, what role does the Valley play vis-a-vis -vis the kind of like the established Fortune 500 type organization? And what role does SAP has to play in the innovation ecosystem? Yeah, so, you know, I think SAP had a, um, a very, very important place in the 90s in terms of an ecosystem and how those ecosystems came about. Um, I think we're in the middle of a massive transformation about how we perceive ecosystems. Um, and how those, the, how those ecosystems will actually participate. Um, you know, we have declared that we would make SAP very open, very accessible, and that we would create an, uh, an app economy around SAP um, where these companies could add value. Now, right now, I would say that's halfway marketing brochure and halfway we we on our way there. Um, but we will, we will, we will, pretty much open the whole of SAP up so that all companies can access and you don't go through these massive long certifications and certification processes to be able to work with SAP. Um, that if you can add value, you can add value. And if you can't, and the customers decide whether it's value or it's not value, sure. not SAP that decides. So yeah. that's that's the world that we would move, we're moving into rapidly. The, the reason for that is because we've obviously re-engineered our ERP software and we've learned a lot about all the cloud products and how cloud products have to work with each other um, in the future. And so we've changed the focus of, of what we're doing at SAP. In that and, and obviously our work together and the fact that SAP and Sapphire work closely together in terms of infusing dollars and, and knowledge into the Absolutely, ecosystem. but I wasn't, you said I couldn't do any pitches, so I don't want to pitch. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I mean, we learn a lot from Sapphire, uh, you know, Sapphire Ventures as well, because, um, you know, we don't, we, we, the Nino and, and Rami and the team, they, they get to do what, what they want to do and they get to share. And they've got to come to us like any, any company and explain what they're doing, but they don't ask for permission to invest or who they invest with and invest in some of our competitors, um, which, is, which is totally fine. And, and you know, I think um, the, mo the, the, the most important um, aspect will be that the to topics that I spoke about, those future topics, those going to have access into our data and be able to add value on top of our data in whatever way that you perceive that value is going to come, whether it be in the neural quantum environments, artificial intelligence uh, environments. And just, you know, we have, um, we have close to 500 R&D people doing this, so we're pretty advanced in terms of what we want to do. They don't, they don't know anything about ERP, but they, they, they do other stuff. Um, and, that, and, and that other stuff, we're going to invest even more in that space because we truly believe that the next generation of Massively is, you know, super smart applications connected to devices that will enable massive transformation in, the in, in multiple industries. And if anybody's in financial services, I guarantee you that will be so disrupted. So actually, that's, uh, that's probably my, my last question, if I, if I can maybe, um, uh, if I can. Um, from an industry's perspective, we will talk later on, we're going to have Anish and Glenn talk about regulated industries and how innovation can actually trans transform that. From your vantage point, what are some of the, uh, the differences between industries that are regulated and unregulated as far as the pace of innovation, and, and is that changing in your opinion? It's a great, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's very interesting, actually. Um, clearly, the ones that are, that are focused on the consumer experience, the, 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 the disruption is automatic, right? It's just people that disrupt that, and, 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 and that happens quick. But, you know, we know that defense, for instance, when we talk about the storm and the hurricane, we, defense is at the hurricane. So, and that's across, across the world. So... Governments are heavily investing in digital disruption. My view is going to be um, that 
the Asian governments, you will start to see the kind of investments in digital disruption at an all-time high. And it's going to be very interesting to see the capital economies of the world decide how they want to actually play in that space. I mean, the one beautiful part is the amount of investments that happen in the valley. So innovation's happening, yeah. But imagine when governments start giving companies money to digi digitally disrupt. And so yep. it's not a case of only commercial. Yep. It's a case of governments. And I, you know, I think it's pretty clear when you talk and you understand, when you work with governments, the confusion around data, data protection rights, how are we going to interconnect, I see Anish is here. So interconnection between governments on how data is going to flow between these environments. I mean, if you go into the European Union, you would think European Union is consistent. Hell no. <laughs> Germany and the Dutch have different views of DPA agreements, right? Yeah. I mean, you want to go through a hello? Have a discussion on this. There's no logic. So these kinds of things are going to be brought to the fore. And there are going to be more and more regulation than we've ever seen in how data flows between different walls in different places. So I see some of the folks in the healthcare industry. I mean, you live in that in, the, in your national environment. Imagine when that goes outside. So, so we are in for disruption with governments, with commercial enterprises, with startups. Across the board, there is no boundary that says, you know, that industry is, is stuck. Right. If I was in the banking industry in North America, I would be scared shitless, really. I mean, I don't know who has a good banking experience. I don't think if I'd ask anybody, yeah, you have a great banking experience, is it something that you get excited for at 9 o'clock? There is no one I know that has a great banking experience. How long do you think that can continue before somebody wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to give somebody a good banking experience. That's a good job. That's a good business to start. On that note, Rob, you've been super generous with your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was great. Thank you, everybody.